as the crow flies on the Vance Crow Podcast. Cool. Bernard, a.k.a. Chubby Emu, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So uh, it is April 16th of 2020. Coronavirus is all around us. And right now, the biggest word on the street, everybody is talking about China. When I had my flash briefing come over my Amazon Alexas this morning, they were talking all about China. And uh, you and I have known each other for a few years. One time you told me something about China that was so staggering to me, I couldn't believe it, that the written language of Chinese has remained the same, and so has, in many ways, the spoken language, so that their culture can be much more uniform, and that they can read things from much further back and understand what they meant in the more literal meaning. Yeah, so uh, Chinese people today, at least the ones who can read traditionally written Chinese, they can read texts all the way back to uh, 200 B.C., So that is the Qing dynasty. So the very first dynasty, there was somebody, um, he he called himself the first emperor because he was the person who unified the entire area. Because traditionally, um, if you go before that time period, China was a bunch of different kingdoms that were fighting for powers, kind of like Europe, except you had one guy was able to consolidate all of that power and he was able to impose strict martial rule. And one of the rules that he imposed was a continuity in culture because he knew that everyone spoke just a slightly different version of the same language. Uh, so that's why you have all these thousands of dialects of Chinese. But he forced everyone to write the same way so that there would be continuity within the kingdom. And so by the time his rule ended, which was only about 20 years, his son was really weak. And then another dynasty was able to capture power. And so then they imposed that same writing system, which persisted all the way until today. So if you wanted to read old texts from more than a thousand years ago, uh, the people who can read traditional Chinese, they can. Some of the words are a little bit different, But uh, that's why when you're taught the classics uh, outside of the mainland where they teach the traditional Chinese, then they're able to understand it. You know, and language is one of those things that if you've never studied or learned a different language, it's hard for you to conceptualize that understanding a word from a different, using a different word to describe something often changes its meaning. It changes how you see it. And, you know, it really change. it really describes how do we see this object. And it's hard to describe because it's not like me saying, oh, dog and perro, you know, like, it's not like, oh, you're naming different nouns. It's the way that you use that language that really describes how your culture interacts with one another. Yeah, and I was like reading uh, a couple of articles the other day about how uh, in Dutch language, swears and slurs are actually based around disease. So there's very possible that like coronavirus disease could become a slur in like the next two or three generations. Um, It's just kind of the nature of humans is that so far, especially in the English speaking world, when we want to have slurs, it's usually, you know, something um, based on religion or based on sex or based on disease. It's based on something that we would see as taboo. And then we use that as like a slur in language. Oh, like an anti-vaxxer. I, I'm not sure about that one, but. That, that, that name in certain circles, if you throw it out there, it's a bomb on somebody. You know, it's like that person is an anti-vaxxer. Oh, they listen to anti-vaxxer. Oh, no, I, I mean, like if you say the F word, right? The F word uh, apparently had a, some different origins than what we use it for now. But, you know, in, in terms of it having like a relation to sex and then having that be a bad word, it, it's related to a taboo subject that you wouldn't necessarily speak forthright about. At least a long time ago, you wouldn't have. Now it's a little bit different. But when you use words in that context, it's like Jesus F Christ, right? That's putting both taboos together in one slur that would be considered offensive to a majority of people that would hear it, right? Wow. And it's definitely uh, cultural and it will grab effect under certain groups that you've put those two very uh, ideas that you would normally distance yourself from, you put them together. 
Yeah, I mean, if you say Jesus F. Christ to a Chinese person, they don't they don't care. I mean, they know who Jesus Christ is, but they don't have the same impact, uh, especially had they grown up in Asia and they weren't Christian. Then if you say it to them, it, it's not as shocking than if you say it to somebody here, like let's say a grandma who, you know, doesn't like using those kinds of words in a public space, then, you know, that could be considered offensive. It's cultural for sure. Yeah. I mean, the more you talk about this, the more I realize that the nicknames that people have for the groups that they don't want around in your community are usually pretty negative. Like when I was in Kenya, the the Kenyans referred to the British whites as Kaburu. And I still don't really know what this means, but it was like, it was not something they would say yelling at somebody or, you know, it would be after somebody walked away and it would be if you treated somebody rudely or as though you were above them. So to call somebody Kaburu was like dirty. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's, yeah, there's definitely places around the world where uh, words used like that are negative, but there's also words that are uh, like say, for example, in Chinese, right? So Chinese, the word for foreigner is a literal translation of outside, from outside the, the kingdom or from outside the country, right? So it's outside country person is the, is the word for foreigner. And so that could be used in a way where, uh, let's say somebody who's not Chinese would find it offensive. They don't technically use it in a way that's offensive, but if you really wanted to be sensitive, you, you could be uh, seen as that way. So um, you have a YouTube channel that is extraordinary. And it's it's extraordinary because uh, you found a particular niche where you have a formula for how you present information and you put it you put these new ideas through this formula and you come out on the other end and the people that have watched your video have just gone on a roller coaster ride like they've had emotional swings they've had polarity they have like ways of thinking about what you're talking about and they get done and they've just learned something and what you're talking about uh, is medicine in a way that nobody talks about it that i had ever seen before Tell me about the evolution of Chubby Emu and how did you hit on this style of communicating and yet having such a goofy ass name, Ch Chubby Emu? <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure that name will never get me verified on Twitter at this point. <laughs> uh, so the, the point of having a name like that, uh, it, it is really the, the, the videos are about the content, right? And it's not, I try to make a point that the videos aren't about me. They're about the person I'm talking about, right? And they're about the education and, you know, the, the medicine and the physiology behind everything. Like that's, that's really the point behind it. And so the way I got to it was kind of strange because back in 2014 is when I left academic medicine and I left Chicago. I, you know, grown up, born and raised in Illinois and so I was thinking, you know, I, I got to make a move somewhere at that point. And I was kind of uh, not happy with the educational bureaucracy. So I went took a corporate role. And so at the corporate level, there's also the same kind of bureaucracy. I thought I'd get away from it, but it, it still exists. It's a little different. Um, and the, the main frustration in medicine was that everything that you do, um, especially when you're in a junior role like I was, uh, you're junior until around 50 in medicine. And so I, I think a lot of people don't realize that, but the youngest NIH funded investigator, I think is 48 or 49 years old. Whoa. And, yeah. And that person is an absolute superstar. Like that is rising, you know, he's, he's going to be a candidate for the Nobel prize, like, like that person, uh, whoever that person is, uh, whatever practice setting man or woman doesn't matter, but the youngest person is in their late forties. Uh, early 50s. And so in medicine, whatever you do is not really yours, especially when you're in a junior role. So I thought, well, what can I do to make something that I can call my own, right? And at the time, it was uh, what, late 2014, 2015. And so YouTube and internet video was like kind of the, the lowest hanging fruit. It's the easiest, uh, lowest barrier to entry into something that you could say like, hey, I made it, right? 
And that's because like, you know, traditional illustration and, you know, writing were, they were difficult to get into. Yeah, you could illustrate some stuff, but uh, how popular would it be, right? You're, you're in a medium that wouldn't necessarily reach as many people that video had the potential to reach. And so for me, I, I had always thought, okay, I think video is probably the way to go. And now how do you enter that space, right? So you get in and, you know, you make a couple videos. Nobody watches them. My first subscriber is my mom. Second one's my sister. Third one was my girlfriend at the time. And, and what then, are you making uh, fourth- though? But like what, what videos are you putting out when you first start? I was playing, uh, so I played video games because I had a, a, an unemployment lull in between the time I left Illinois and went over to the East Coast. And so playing a lot of video games and girlfriend at the time had suggested, hey, um, how about this? Why don't you just make uh, videos of you playing the video game? Because that's super popular right now. That could teach you how to make a video. It doesn't need to be a good video, but it's a video. And from there, you can uh, start learning more. And so I thought about it. I was like, this is a no brainer. So let's simple. just be clear because you're the, a lot of my listeners are literally getting onto tractors right now, polishing up their planters and getting ready. Some of them are already going out and getting their fields ready to be planted. And yep. the thought that someone would watch a video that you made of you playing video games is would blow them away. They cannot imagine. First of all, they don't play video games. And if they did, they certainly wouldn't sit around and watch videos of other people playing video games. So it's shocking that that would be the path that somebody that's as articulate as you are got onto this. I, I want to just highlight just how weird <laughs> that would be, right? Uh, well, it, it's weird to me because especially when I see those videos and, you know, just kind of the thoughts that I had circulating around in my head at the time, uh, it was it was a path to learning how to make a video, right? That was the most important one. But then also at the time, it was super popular. I mean, that was like kind of the heyday. Uh, it still is a heyday of what they call the genre of let's play YouTubers. Um, like the top 10 YouTube channels, I think, four or five of them are let's play channels because these are people that will play video games. Each video will be 30 minutes, 30 something minutes long. And let's just say it has a million views and everyone's watching for 15 minutes or more. And they do that twice a day. Like if you want to see the top YouTube channels by watch time, you're looking at somebody who scores 250 million views every month on YouTube and multiply it by a watch time average of around anywhere from 15 to 18 minutes per view, you're looking at several billion minutes of time spent by people watching this person play video games. And they might not even be good at playing that game. They're just entertaining to watch and that the game is a medium for them to entertain people through. So, I mean, the the thought of having billions of minutes of attention is one of those things where people are like, yeah, I know we're in the future, but they don't really understand that, like the people that are doing that a billion minutes of attention have more sway over the people than the most powerful Kings of any time, right? That they could have people watching them and hearing their voice and hearing their opinion on things and getting ideas out. Like the medium that you're talking about for many other people is like, they can't even imagine that there are millions of people watching these things at all. But then also the knock on consequences of that, which is these people, people like you have a really outsized voice once they capture attention. Uh, Yes. And also, no, you have to keep in mind the kind of action that they can uh, put out based on what they have in the videos. So a lot of it's cultural action. So, you know, if, if they might say something, they might be able to sway an opinion over one thing or over another, but it depends on what space that opinion is. Like, you know, if a let's player was going to talk about what they think of a clinical trial for COVID-19, <laughs> people probably not going to, you know, listen to what that person's opinion is. Right. <laughs> Although they're, that's funny because th- that's me, right? Uh, I, if, if, if it was five years ago and I was talking about my opinion on a COVID clinical trial in a Let's Play video, pro- people probably wouldn't have listened to me. But back you had then, to start somewhere. Totally if you had, you, because so you do Let's Play videos and then keep going with your evolution. I interrupted you. Oh, so um, I just saw my numbers drop, right? And it's uh, I think there was a whole year where you know I I didn't like editing videos. I, I kind of lost sight of making a better video 
And so I was just putting out videos just for the hell of it. And uh, I, I kind of figured there would be a point where I would get into that kind of rut. And then when I finally realized it, I thought, you know what, I need to like, I need to step out of it and try something different. And I knew at the time, whatever I tried actually probably wouldn't do that well, because one, it would have been a bad video, but two, it would have been significantly different than from the regular video game videos that I was putting out at the time. But I said, no matter what, let me try. So I think I put out my first medical video in like July of 2016. And it was about uh, a hot topic at the time was a loperamide overdose. So people were taking Imodium um, to get over like opioid withdrawal. And so they were, uh, because loperamide is actually an opiate analog and it doesn't easily cross the blood brain barrier. So you can't really get high from it. But if you take a bunch of it, if some of it will uh, eventually cross into the brain. Oh and my the God. Problem, but the yeah. cost would be that you're taking a, a, a modium, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. The, the cost would be that, uh, it has the same side effects as opiates that you would be constipated to all hell, but it also stops your heart too. It stops your heart in a similar way to how, uh, an overdose of hydroxychloroquine would. So bring to bring it back to today's events. Uh, it does stop the heart. So there was people dying of cardiac arrest because they found out that they could take Imodium for heroin withdrawal, uh, and it wasn't good. And so there was a push to put Imodium behind the counter um, so that people couldn't access it, similar to how Sudafed was. Uh, and and you put this video out, and how did your audience of people that have watched you? Because because to be fair, you hadn't just put out videos like this. You put out videos of you powerlifting, about yeah. you like the way that you and I came in contact with one another was that I was searching how much protein should you eat in a day. I, I had gotten into a weightlifting kick. I wanted to get fit, and I found your stuff. And you you had these videos of you ma making and eating like. I don't know, a dozen eggs in a day. What was it, two dozen eggs? I don't remember what it was. Uh, yeah, yeah, there was there were those videos. So that was um, over the summer. I figured, you know, to litter throughout like the regular content that I would try to put out every day. I would litter it with, you know, different kinds of videos of like, I don't know, 14 eggs for breakfast or um, something about like I ate like a whole tub of chicken breasts or something, you know, just just for fun, right? And then I, uh, I think at the beginning of 2016, I made a video about how I lost 60 pounds in 16 weeks. And that was the first time that I had worked with my fat loss coach at the time. Uh, but I mean, that what, I worked with him in like 2007, 2006, I think. So it was like a good 10 years out. And so I had, remember I had contacted him because we had kept in touch throughout those 10 years. And I said, hey, um, I'm a YouTuber now. And uh, let me, can I make a video about how I lost all the weight? And he's like, yeah, that'd be great. And I said, I'll, I'll, I'll plug you. And I think at the time I had like a thousand subscribers or something. And he's like, hey man, like it, and any word getting out would be great. So I made that video and it like, it, it didn't, it did well at the time for having a thousand subscribers. And then it subsequently died in like the next nine months of 2016. But around like the fall is when it started to pick back up. And I remember like fall, winter 2016, the thing was getting like, 10,000 views a day. And, you know, to me, I would, that's more subscribers that I had. And I thought, you know, uh, this is great. And so by the end of 2016, I gained a bunch of weight because I was doing things like, you know, eating 28 eggs for breakfast for the hell of it for a YouTube video. <laughs> but also at the same time, the YouTube was, uh, it was really starting to not, uh, it was becoming apparent that whatever I was doing was not worth the effort. So the, the, reality was is that you had to change the effort, not necessarily put more effort in. You just need to take an entirely different approach. And if people don't like it, you just don't listen to it because you have uh, a further sight for what you want to do. And you know, this is kind of like a you looking after yourself type of thing. So um, by the time that you had contacted me in, in late December of 2016, I thought, hey, this is a good opportunity to start losing weight again, because I think I was like already like, I, I was starting to, you know, get really heavy and there's pictures of it. And so the beginning of January, 2017 is then when I started doing the fat loss vlog and that did okay for the first couple episodes and then subsequently died again. 
And so I remember uh, it was hard for me to keep up doing one video a week. And for me, I was changing the effort, not necessarily doing more, but changing the way I wanted to approach it. But then that got stale too. And so by the end of the 16 weeks of me losing the weight, I kind of just like stopped caring about the videos. And I said, what do I do now? Because every time I upload a video, uh, I lose like a couple hundred subscribers People, you know, watch for like 10 seconds to see the beginning, to see how much I've progressed since the last week. And they click off the video and that's it, you know, it, it's over. And so I, I took a good two or three weeks off from making videos. And I said, you know what, either I quit now, two years in, or I just, I, I just look around my room and thought, well, what do I do? And so I, I looked down at my desk and there was the computer that made every single like 200 of those videos that I had posted by that point. And I said, you know what, why don't I just make a video about this computer just for the hell of it? And so I made a, it was a, by then it was seven years old. And so I thought, okay, you know, let me, I, I have footage of me building this computer in 2010. Why don't I repurpose some of that footage? And that way that's a different approach. I'll tell the story of this computer, what I'm going to do with it next and how it's benefited me since. And so I think I titled the uh, video I, I paid or I bought this PC for 1360 in 2010. This I'll is throw how it, it in the show notes, yeah, for sure, yeah, yeah. And so uh, I used the footage from when I built it. I, I built it with my buddy, and so like we we were doing all this stuff, and I, I wrote like I wrote out a formal script, you know, talking about hey, like if if you're like me, my age, you know, you, you remember computers and you know how they progressed throughout the 90s and 2000s, and it kind of seems like it's stagnated now a little bit. And so that video, it, it did okay at first. And I remember I went to Chicago for a cancer conference. And then as I was at that cancer conference, it was getting like, I think two or 300,000 views a day. Like it just kind of exploded all of a sudden. And I'm like, oh, okay, so this is a new format. Like this would be that different effort. Uh, what else can I do it on? So I figured, well, that's about that computer. I still have computers I from 20 years ago that I brought with me from Illinois. No idea what I was going to do with them, but I still have them. Why don't I just make a video about it? And there was like a computer I got in 99. Well, and to make it so everybody's clear, you live, I don't know if you want to say what city you live in. D.C. You live in D.C., and space is at a premium, right? Like it is expensive yeah. to have carried around the things that you have. And I, I mean, I live there. Thank God I'm not on, on coronavirus because when I lived there, my wife and I lived in a 480 square foot apartment that looked out on a brown brick wall. It would have been, this, this pandemic would have been terrible. So for you to take the precious space that you have and be lugging around computers meant they had some meaning for you, but you dug them out and found a way to turn them into learning gold really right yeah and so for me it was like learning how to tell a story of a of a computer right i mean it, that's like probably the one thing that a lot of people would just say like what the hell's the point you know it's a thing that you bought in 1999 like why do you still have it right and so uh that the 1999 video was i think the last computer video i made i, I there was one where i got like a, a laptop for free in 2008 because i joined um some survey panel <laughs> and they were like, we're going to give you a laptop for free. And so I remember like at the time I was using it and uh, you know, I have some footage from back in like 2008, 2009, I had like one of those flip cameras and like, you know, video to, has always had like importance to me. Like I have videos of me talking into cameras since like 2004. And then I have a video of myself from like 93, which may never see the light of day, but you know, you see a, uh, what is it? 93. I was nine. You have a nine year old me, uh, in this video. And so, uh, that was, that was basically the template, but I figured, uh, I don't really have as, a, as much of a future to tell stories of computers because I don't have that many computers, right? I got four or five of them. How many videos could I possibly make? <laughs> Right. And so when I made the 1999 video, I had been thinking about this since I moved out of New York down to DC. And I thought, hey, why don't I, uh, why don't I do a, a medical case that I had been thinking of? And this kind of materialized, I think, around in April. And so we did the video about the woman who drank three gallons of water in two hours. And so based it off of the story that happened in California. And so I thought, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff in there, right? 
what is water poisoning? How does it necessarily kill you, right? And it's actually a very intricate process. And there's a lot of things to explain about how it swells up into your brain and you could die from that. And why didn't she vomit or urinate out any of the water, right? There's all reasons to why it happened the way that it did. And so I thought, why don't I post this last computer video on the Saturday, uh, August 5th, and then on Monday, August 7th, I'll put up the three gallons water video. I think I had sent you that video before I published it, like a week before I published it. And so um, you, you thought it was interesting. You're like, oh yeah, this would be good. So I, I put it up on that Monday and you know, it got some decent traction. People thought it was kind of weird. They're like, I thought you were talking about computers. Why are you talking about a woman drinking three gallons of water? And so I went to Cleveland for work to talk with some people at the clinic. And then I remember, I think it was like Wednesday or Thursday, the thing started spiking at like 25,000 an hour, right? Then it went to 60,000 an hour. And like the jumps were, I had never seen that before. I had never gotten 60,000. I remember it was like watching a guy hit a gold mine or something because I was like clicking in and watching this video rocket forward. It, it was yeah. it was awesome. We were checking in every couple hours because the numbers were going so fast. Yeah. And so for me, like, then I thought, you know what, like, this is originally I thought, how do I, how do I create something I can call my own and would it have to end up being in my working field? And so originally I, I did the video games because one games are fun. Medicine is not necessarily fun. Right. And so by the time you got there, I, I had to make a choice to say like, do I want this channel to be about just fun? Or do I want to actually talk about some serious stuff and try to make it fun? And so that was then when the change happened. And so once I saw that video do pretty well, um, I said, you know what? This is the format I want to stick with. And from there, I want to learn how to make a better video every time. So I, ha I have all these different cases that I saw in the emergency room when I was in practice. So, you know, all these different ones. There's also ones that I can't talk about on YouTube because they talk about very, very sensitive issues. And so just give you an example. Last fall, I made a video about a boy who ate only potato chips and French fries. And that was something that came out in a news story. And it's a story of a vitamin B12 deficiency. Well, I had a case of vitamin B12 deficiency I wanted to release in December of 2017. The problem is, is that um, there's child abuse and there's suicide involved. So because of that, uh, I think YouTube would find it unpalatable. And it, it is very sensitive story. Like it, it's, a, it's a terrible story, but it's an important one. But I took the B12 deficiency from the boy who only ate potato chips and french fries because it's... Uh, while it is still a tragedy, it's not the same level of tragedy as what happened to that girl in the original one that I wanted to put out. And it's, it strikes me that you've been learning and, and honing this craft and the things that you can talk about and how you've gotten better and better and better. And I don't know what it was, a month and a half ago? You uh, ended up doing a collaboration with other people in China, I presume, I don't know, but it was a coronavirus uh, video in your standard. So for people that don't know, uh, Bernard's videos are like Dr. House on, on cocaine or something. It's, it's the, instead of having all the drama around where there's like romances and things like that, Bernard's videos are like, uh, a woman did this and this is what happened to her brain or to her liver or to her whatever. And then he goes through and describes the medical case for what happens. So it is a whipsaw, like, roller coaster of emotions for what's happening because oftentimes he describes it in a way where you're like i probably wouldn't do that but whoa it'd be bad if it happened to me and he ended up uh not only building a u.s audience but also a chinese audience and he just recently no not just recently way before the curve put out a video on coronavirus and about what it does to your lungs and it was one of those things that like really woke me awake yeah, I'm lucky because uh, back in 2017, there was a person, he was a resident, uh, I think, in uh, Guangzhou province or Guangzhou, China. And so he, um, he was translating my videos and posting it to Chinese social media with subtitles. So it would be English, like English words with Chinese on top. And so the people who uh, wanted to listen, they could learn some English from it. 
by both listening to what I'm saying and also reading and correlating with the Chinese characters. And so he had asked my permission to repost it at the time. And I thought, no, um, I, I like, I don't know what happens on Chinese social media. Cause you know, they don't have Facebook, they don't have Google, uh, they don't have Twitter and that kind of stuff. So then I, I looked a little bit further and I'm like, well, this guy was really asking for forgiveness because he had already done all of the translating. And, posting. <laughs> and so I, I saw that and I'm like, okay. And so I told him, I said, sure, uh, you can, but you, you do have to make a, a chubby emu channel. You can't put it under your name, David Lai, right? Because I'm not David Lai. And so he agreed. And what, what ended up happening, and that was in 2018, is that this team exploded into like a group of, I think like at least 15 or 20 people. And so what ended up turning out is that I hopped in a, in a WeChat with them. And it turns out that they were all, you know, doctors and scientists all throughout China. And they were interested that they're like, they were at the you university. You created your level. own gravity well uh, before you even got there of people that would, the type of person that would want to translate your videos and make them available is the type of person that's like you. He's just not making those videos, but he's in another location. You created a place where people could congregate. That's a gravity well. Yeah, it was interesting. So I, I think he's now a full attending physician, but he didn't see uh, like huge amounts of coronavirus because he's in the south part of China. And so when the coronavirus hit, I remember I had went uh, back to Illinois for the Chinese New Year. And like, you know, we had all these announcements, oh, coronavirus. And, you know, people people were still joking about it at the time. Um, they're still joking about it, but it's a little bit different now than it was back then. And so he had told me, he said, yeah, um, Wuhan is probably going to get locked down. And I think they, they had the suspicions of it because it seemed like it was pretty severe. And so I said, I'm like, do we have anybody on the team for, who's from Wuhan? And so they had a couple people from the province that Wuhan is in. And then what happened was they were like, yeah, we know a bunch of the, uh, we know some pathologists and radiologists and uh, critical care doctors that are in the Jinyan 10 hospital. And so I thought, okay, uh, can we get in touch? And so we were able to get on with them and talk about what was going on as it started to get crazy. And so they were starting to, they were able to pull some of the cases from the database to say like, you know, these are some pretty severe cases. Um, and they said, you know, as long as we're not giving out the patient information, it's fine, but this is the message that we want to get out. And so for me at the time, it, it was hard to get it out right in January. So I ended up, I think, releasing it at near the end of February. And that was as the news was starting to get big here. In America, I mean, it didn't really get huge until probably, what, late March. So we had like a whole month worth so of- when you know. around did you start working on this video with those guys? Uh, so that started uh, January 23rd. So it was probably like a month uh, before it was posted. And uh, what happened when you posted that video? How did people respond to it? Uh, it was good at first. So um, things kind of wax and wane on YouTube. And so for probably the last year, it, it's a lot different now than it was two years ago, uh, which is to be expected when you think of this kind of medium. So at that, at that point, a lot of people were wondering, you know, what, like, why is this a serious thing? Like, what, what is this virus doing? And are people like, should they, should we really be taking it seriously? Like, is it just the flu? And so uh, the answer is no, it's not just the flu. Um, but also you shouldn't be like, like you should be alert, but you shouldn't be freaking out about it. You should be alert. And, you know, if you don't need to go somewhere and you don't need to, you know, get up close to somebody you probably shouldn't. And that holds held true back then. And it definitely holds true now. So as you think about the way the U.S. reacted, there's a bunch of people that want to talk about uh, politics and about, you know, whose fault it was. But I'm really interested in at what point in somebody's network that they started talking or communicating about coronavirus, did they start taking it seriously? Was it when it hit the mainstream news? You know, the there's a guy, Strange Donuts um, guy, Jason Bachman, talks about when they shut down the NBA that's when I knew things were serious. <laughs> but for, for me, I remember I actually watched a video of a guy that used to live in China and he was making videos that seemed almost conspiratorial about how dangerous coronavirus was in China. 
And he said, but if you're worried about all that nonsense, the you can't get a vaccine for coronavirus, but you can get one for the flu. Just go out and get your flu vaccine because that'll be it'll increase the odds that you won't get the, the influenza in addition to coronavirus. And so I was like, oh, all right, I'll go do that. And I think about those moments where you see information that changes your behavior in the real world. And I'm wondering how where where those places were that people heard about the disease that made them start taking an action. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I think the NBA was a big one. Um, and then the governments doing what they were doing. And then you see the stock market falling. I think it was uh, March 11th or March 13th when you saw like the major drop of more than 7%. And all of a sudden, uh, they had to halt trading for 15 minutes to let everyone cool off. And I think people then were still probably unsure of the panic. I think around that time, Elon Musk put out coronavirus panic is dumb, right? And uh, that turned out to have not aged very well, um, just because the thing is in America, because we, I, I mean, I'd, America is kind of strange because it's like, it is a, a confederation of states, right? And so states are able to do things fairly independently of the Fed, but also not really. And so the, the Fed is able to, you know, flex its strength and be the big coin, so to say, uh, to keep states in line. But states do have relative autonomy to say, you know, if, if you don't want to close down all the schools and put it at the county level, then you can do that if you wish, right? So it, it's a little bit different. But once the governors started declaring the states of emergency, first one being, I think, Washington State on um, 229, 2020, then people started thinking, oh, you know, this could be something. I remember I was supposed to be in San Francisco on March 6th, and I ended up canceling the week before uh, while I was at a melanoma conference here in DC. And the reason I canceled was I didn't know what was going to happen. And back then, I'm just thinking about this now, uh, one of my colleagues texted me, we had a dinner that night and it was packed in downtown DC. And just imagine three weeks later, you wouldn't even be able to sit down in a restaurant like that, right? And it was only three weeks later. You know, it's like, what changed? Because the virus, uh, it, it was already here by then, right? It just hadn't infected as many people. And so that was what prompted, I think, a lot of people is like when the officials started taking action to say like, look, if you don't do something now, it's, it can get a lot worse. That's the thing with medicine is that uh, there's a huge unknown behind it. And so there's, because there's an unknown, uh, it can breed fear and it, it depends on what kind of personality person handles that fear. Um, that was what the outcome is going to be. You know, I get together with a group of guys on Thursday night when you've been in town, you've been able to cruise by there. And I remember the night that we decided like, hey, this is probably the last time we're going to get together in a group and we're going to make sure that we don't shake hands when we see each other. There's no like pats on the back. Like we're going to be distant. We're going to we're going to have this one last time together. And it was still a surreal time for me when that happened, because it wasn't until I got back home and uh, and a couple of days went by and then the city put in the order. It might have been a week later that you you had to do a stay at home uh, that I was really like this is real that we won't just be able to go over to our friend's house anymore like I knew it was happening but it didn't really fully hit me now you really can't go to that crowded restaurant I even if you did and you didn't get arrested there nobody else would show up with you no one responsible would show up with you yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it, it's really changed a lot, especially when I saw the text from that, that person. I'm like, holy, well, I, you know, I haven't seen this person for what six or seven weeks at this point. And the last time I saw him, he was at a restaurant with me, and you know, we were with all our colleagues um, for melanoma research. And I was like, you know, this is, uh, yeah, I remember canceling that San Francisco trip and telling another one of my colleagues. So he's a surgeon out at Stanford. And saying, because we were, I was going to meet up with him, we were going to make some YouTube videos. And so after that, I said, you know, with what's happening in San Francisco, I don't think I'm going to be able to go. Uh, I think it's probably better if I don't, and maybe we can reschedule for some time later. I thought sometime later would be early summer. That definitely doesn't seem like that'll be the case now. Yeah, I was definitely, I was supposed to be on to do a tour a week across Canada. 
And uh, when it got canceled, I wrote the guy that that we canceled it with and was like, hey, man, let's meet up in a couple weeks after all this stuff passes. The flights will be really cheap. Like I, I, I figured like, hey, this is serious and I'm not going out. But I really did not understand, and I don't think most people did. We weren't entering a, a coronavirus, like my buddy Nick Cizik says. We weren't entering a coronavirus a blizzard. We were entering a coronavirus winter, and that it's actually going to be a longer period of time. Oh yeah, yeah, it'll be uh, it'll be pretty long, and especially with like the economic recovery and all that. All our medical conferences are canceled, right? And so I'm supposed to be at one right now in New York. It's it's weird looking at my work phone and still having it on my calendar and just thinking like I, I should be at like a precision medicine conference right now, but you can't go to New York. Oh, yeah. I was supposed to be speaking at the American Baking Association, and this is where all the bakers from all over the United States um, get together. So big, big brands, and they think about how are we going to provide the baking needs? And my whole talk was going to be this week on the breaking open of the Overton window, and I was saying right now you guys are on the inverse side of um, people thinking, hey, keto, protein, high protein, no carbs, baked goods are bad, you know, and uh, and I was going to be talking about how, you know, someday that may flip and you may be on the on the opposite side of that. And that day actually happened with coronavirus because people are buying so much flour, yeast, um, you know, things that, that they can make bread and carbohydrates with that they can't keep it on the stores and when I was scheduling my talk, if I had told those people, this is what I'm going to talk about, they would have said, you're a crazy person. You can't come here to give a talk. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's definitely changed a lot. And I, I remember saying in uh, one of my own podcast episodes is that it's permanently warped the psyche of people, uh, whether or not they realize it. Because once we're able to go back out, the question is, is that, is it really safe to go back out, Right. And then the other one is, you know, who knows how how much is going to happen because it's like, uh, what is it? I have friends who help me with my videos. They're production assistants. They work on TV sets. They're dark until uh, at least the fall. And so these are people who rely on paycheck to paycheck. They rely on TV shows going through, and these TV shows aren't going through, right? So how do you how do you survive? Right. I mean, if, if the person just had two kids last year. Right. And he's relying on this paycheck on a TV show that's not going to happen. Uh, how do you live? And right. And that's just one person. Think about all the other people who do some kind of media production here in D.C. And let's just say some people might be OK with some of the newest organizations, but some other people probably not going to be OK if they do you know, other kinds of media production. Well, and that's going on in parts of the economy that people don't even realize. So I have a friend that is a part of a, a dairy co-op and uh, he said, hey, we had to let go of some of our lobbyists. You know, we have people that we pay to go, at, you know, go advocate for us. Now we really need people to advocate for us. But unfortunately, we do it based on we have them a budget based on how much milk are we selling and right now, with the restaurants being shut off, we're not selling that milk. We've we've lost thirty percent of our market, and so you wouldn't think about it. But in a place like D.C., a whole bunch of lobbyists being laid off takes people that normally would have been at the top of society and throwing them out and saying, "You got to go find something else to do." Yeah, exactly. And then you see like um, what is the cruise ship industry, and you know, lots of other different things. What is even sports like? Think about it. If sports are going to be shut down until next year, think about all those people that were working at the baseball stadiums, you know, if they were working at the tickets or working at selling some of the concessions. Think about all the people. I mean, what fills up a baseball stadium in St. Louis is that um, people have business connections there. It's a way for you to be able to meet up with somebody that you're selling to or you're buying from or you're trying to get a partnership together. So a lot of people, they go for fun, but there are a lot of people at those games because that's the way you get two guys together to talk about something or you get a, a whole booth and you have a bunch of people from a department show up and they mix together and they get to talk. All that stuff ends those networks where they slam together and there's some amount of randomness and you do it for sports. Like I, all of those business relationships are going to have to be picked up and built in some other way. And I, I, I wonder who moves into the post coronavirus 
world first and able to adapt and make up for the fact that you can't do business over a Cardinals game. Yeah, that one's going to be interesting. I mean, I have colleagues out in Boston uh, at Harvard, and they I don't think they've announced yet in Boston, but there's a good chance it's coming that the fall semester is going to be all virtual. Um, yeah, and so a lot of the universities, because think about it, Boston being the number one educational city in the entire world, you have everyone from every different country there. Uh, how do you have contact precautions in that case? You can't. How do you do freshman orientation in that case? You can't, right? So uh, a lot of uh, they haven't announced it yet again, but it's likely that they would be moving to online. I mean, only. we've made the joke a bunch of times on this show about how cities, apartment buildings are CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations that people make fun of in the city or they think are so terrible. But um, they they are that's you know, we think about, well, the, the you have all these apartments, people stacked on top of each other. They eat in a central location. They bathe. They get connected. What is a dorm other than a giant CAFO? And you're taking this population that you want them to be. Uh, you you figure most of them are resilient. They're probably not going to die. But you put them there. That you're not going to let them home for Thanksgiving. You're not going to let them home for Christmas when they come home and infect the family and grandma and all those things. Like unless we have stopped it from being endemic in society, even if the prevalency rate is low, the stories that come out on of. Uh, the kid that went away to college and came back and killed grandma are going to be too scary for people to, to accept. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, that, that's all part of warping the psyche of people now. And it's not just here, it's Europe, Asia, right? Asia had a scare 20 years ago with the first SARS outbreak. I think this is a lot worse now. And so, I mean, even when you even cancel the Olympics, right? So what or do delay you think- the Olympics? What what is what is your read on how the Chinese people feel about this? Because in American media, we're watching like, oh, it's slowing down in Taiwan. It's better in Hong Kong. It's getting well in China. They're flattening the curve. So are Chinese people like basically living ordinary lives now? Or what happens when they open up this stuff in cities and let them go back to the way they were? So I talked with some of them when they lifted up the lockdown orders in Wuhan back uh, last week. I think it was April 7th when they relaxed it. Uh, It was a lot of people wanted to leave the city because they weren't from there and they got stuck there with the lockdown because January 23rd, 10 a.m., there was military style lockdown. Tanks at the borders, at the train station were police. They stopped the trains. You couldn't get out of the city. And the reason for that was that probably somebody that got out would be infected and then they would spread it to the other provinces, right? And so a lot of people who weren't from there, they said, hey, we got to get out of here, right? And so when they got out, um, there's in the media here, like we hear about there's fears that it could potentially be spreading again. Uh, That's not what I'm seeing, but I I don't know. Uh, Talking with them, some people, um, there is some like, I don't even know if discrimination is the right word. It might not be. Um, There's people who... They are, uh, if they're coming back and they're originally from Hubei province, they're like, they're not allowed to go back to like their apartment building in whatever other province or other state. Wait, say that again. The, the, who is not allowed to travel or how is so that? So somebody, so, so an Wuhanese person, um, if they live somewhere else technically, but they're from Wuhan and they were in Wuhan during the lockdown, uh, their landlord might say, no, you can't come back. You can get your stuff and leave. Wow. Yeah. Just because they don't know, like, w- w- does does the infection have something to do with specifically Wuhan people? And th- there's there's a lot of that stuff. And so we don't really know the exact specifics because, you know, somebody in that situation is not going to report it in English. But, you know, there's there's definitely stuff like that happening because some of my translators are from uh, Hubei province. You were a doctor. And you um, have been in patient care. One of the things that I'm interested in is this fact of that the liberty that people have to go to church, right? They want to get together. It's enshrined in the Constitution. It appears to me that you have the right to do it. But at the same time, people bring up with me, hey, you go to church and you spread this disease. You are adding a huge number of people that could get really, really sick and take that into a hospital and infect more medical workers because they're right now way behind on on protective equipment 
and you that you know that's so bad that we should create a rule that says you can stop people from going to church i want to do the right answer but it feels to me like liberty is the bigger risk than getting people sick but if it's me if my wife were a nurse i would be like hell no don't let them go and do that so how should i think about this more objectively that's a good question um because it should just be any kind of like people gathering it should be subject to needing that distance right i mean it it doesn't matter what setting it's in uh and i know that you know for some of the people who are you know into the worship and all of that like they want to go to church right especially easter was just this past weekend right um so for that case i mean it it, it should just be kind of all around that you know you need to be socially distant preferably isolated from one another for the time being. I mean, uh, there's some people who are afraid that it might become permanent. Um, but for religious, I, I don't think it should like, it shouldn't become permanent like that provided that, you know, these people who are enforcing the policies are true to their word. And so the, then the question is, is that if we can't get together, uh, to do business or to do, to do the normal things that we would have over the last, you know, my entire lifetime up until now, um, that church, I mean, it, it's the same thing, right? That if you abstract it to the highest level to say, these are still people that are getting together and we're trying to stop that by isolating and separating people for the time being, then they would have to be held to their word to say that for the time being is the crucial clause there. Cause it can't just be like, well, we don't like your religion. So we're just going to say you can never get together ever again right? Then that would be overstepping the bound. But this is for the time being, we can't do business. We, there's a lot of things we can't do. Um, I think there was a special on TV. What is it? One of the big churches in Texas, they did like a televised session for Easter. Obviously, it's not ideal. It's not optimal. Um, but nothing is optimal right now. Yeah. You know, I hadn't thought about it until you're saying it like in this way. It's not like they're letting some people go to church and not others. It's not like they're saying, hey, the Catholics over here, they're cool, but the the Jewish people, they're not allowed to go. Like that that's not happening. And so I I will give it credit that uh it does seem to be at least along religious lines evenly applied. And then you just have the question of essential services versus church. But I I I take your point. I don't think people should. I'm not going to do it. I, I think my biggest concern is, and this is the concern a lot of people have, is are we sure the disease is so bad that we should give up liberties? And are we certain that we're going to get them back? And that's what people are afraid of. That's the context. And I ha I would love to just let it pass and, hey, by July, you know, we're going to get all our rights back and everything's fine. But I'm concerned that maybe it's just easier to govern people if they're locked in their house. I, I, how, what do you think of that? Well, it's easier to govern people when they're locked in their house, but it's not easy to govern them when uh, they don't have food to eat and when they're not generating any revenue. Uh, so that would probably be the counterpoint to it because, uh, it, you know, just thinking about it, I, this is the one time that we're living through this. When people talk about, uh, what is it, the 1918 flu and, you know, how people got through it or whatever, nobody alive today was alive back then. Right. I, I, there's probably a couple people who are, in, what is it, over 100 years old now. But if they are that age, they probably don't remember the year 1918. So, no, like none of us have actually lived through something like this. We've read accounts of it having passed. And so um, I, I think you would this the vigilance would need to be on the other side. It would be what is how, how do we get everything back? when life returns to normal. The question is, is that what is it gonna look like when life is normal? Because how do we know whether or not that virus is gonna start spreading around again, right? We don't know. And so those are all the questions. And I would say the easiest way is to keep your eyes on China to see what they're doing because they're the ones that are furthest ahead in time on this, right? Um, just like on social media back in January and February, you saw a lot of, ha ha, look at China, look at what they're doing, ha ha, look, look at this response, right? And then if you look at the reality, just beyond the words, <laughs> we're doing it now too, right? And so it would be reasonable to suspect that 
those other countries who have gotten past the point that we're at now are probably doing the same thing on their social medias to us saying, ha ha, look at this response, you know, and laughing. And that's just because they were watching what was being done here back then. And then if we, we, we have to look at how they're doing it because they're furthest ahead. Do we want to exactly replicate what they're doing? It probably wouldn't work given the differences in culture here, but we have to kind of see the principles of what was being done, why it was being done. And then if parts of it can be applied here, which parts would it be? And I so, have to imagine that the Chinese crackdown, were, or at least the Chinese stay-at-home order, was much more uh, thoroughly enforced than what it is here. I don't know, but I can tell you that when I drive from point A to point B for a very limited task, I see, I think there's maybe a 15% reduction in the number of cars that I used to see out and about. Now, I'm on main thoroughfares, so it could be that often the uh, often the arteries or on the veins that are way away from regular commerce, they're a lot lower. But man, there are a lot of people out there. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like even sometimes like if I need to go out and get lunch or something, right, for pickup, um, you know, you just drive by the Target and the parking lot is packed, right, on a Saturday afternoon. And you're just like, that's, uh, I, you know, I, I think inside the store, they probably have nice precautions. But, you know, the the point is is that you don't want that large gathering of people right and so over in china i know some people that were on my translation team were telling me they had community leaders that they had to report into and like a community leader would you know check the seals on the doors to make sure that people weren't like leaving their place and so um i don't know if those community leaders were associated with government or if they were volunteer that were given down by like the uh, local government but it uh they did that over there. Uh, I think they can do that over here. We would not be able to get away with doing that here. That's for sure. Well, so and the so impression, that, and this is interesting to th hear about what your perspective is, because the impression is that the reason that it worked in China to have the limitation measures they did is because either they used force or that the people were afraid of their government that they would have to do that. But there is the perspective that they also have a more community-minded spirit, right? Like the idea of disappointing the community because you were the lone person that just kept going out doing what you wanted to do. You would be socially isolated much faster there. Is that is that accurate or fair? To um, so uh, to your point on fear, I actually, when I talked with those people, and I have family there too, it doesn't seem like there's fear of government over there. What it seemed like was fear of endangering others. And so in a community sense, it was a little bit different. Um, they have more of a, uh, a mindset to say, you know, this is, uh, they, they have more of like a, a community mindset rather than here we have more of an individual mindset. So it's, it's a little bit different culturally. Um, but, you know, like when they saw stuff like the initial campaign here, uh, 15 days to limit spread, I remember some of their comments where uh, I'm afraid it's going to have to be a little longer than 15 days. Right. And the reality was, is that if they were being honest about it, it wasn't 15 days. We understand they were trying to stage expectations. So they say 15 days back in March. But reality is, is that it's probably closer to 75 days to limit spread is what the the full campaign would probably be if they were to put it that way. But over here, you, you do kind of want to stage the expectations. Problem with staging the expectation is now we don't actually know when it's going to end. So like in Virginia, I think they the stay-at-home orders until June 10th. Um, I don't know why, but it's uh, it, I would say that's probably a little bit more realistic, um, just saying with how things are. But I mean, when it's I been go to my Virginia. expectation. So, uh, you know, uh, my wife and I were, she's, she's got a physical therapy business and, uh, she's trying to decide, she's like, gosh, I just wish I'd, I know when we'd go back. And I was like, you know, in real, in reality, what you should be thinking of is if let's just say there aren't any rules that you can't go back, when would you want to, right? Like at what point would you need to see something that would make you confident that it's a good idea to go back and that you wouldn't be uh, pulled into the the vector of the virus to either get it or to, to have negative things happen and you can't go to the hospital. And 
it's better for you to make the realization that I've got to pivot my business because the world is going to be different. And you really just want to think about it in like a post coronavirus way. Do you agree with that? Are we, do, are we inevitably going to be in a post coronavirus world and people should start pivoting their business or their activities? Um, yeah, they probably do want to look at how to, how to do things a little bit differently just because the, it's going to linger in people's minds for a while. Like it's probably by the end of this year, people will still be thinking about it. I mean, the, if you think about it, like every year between April and December, things just seem to fly by every year. Right. So the next thing we know, it's going to be fall time, right? What, what is the fall going to look like if the kids in college are still going to be home, but doing online lectures, uh, how are we going to be working? Like, we don't know, right? Like if you're doing your speaking events, how are those going to be structured, right? Which ones are you going to be able to go to? And when you do go to them, how far apart are the audience going to be from one another, right? Yeah, and what's the benefit? I mean, so many people say the networking, all it's, it's all done at the bar, but it's not like you're going to want to encourage people to go to a, a gathering and then get together and have drinks and, and party. Like, you may have an interest in doing that to make those business collisions happen, but you sure would hate to be the, the group that went and knocked out all of its members or a significant number of members. That'd be real, real hard on your brand. Yeah, exactly. So as you look out into the future, the next two weeks, what do you think the world will look like two weeks from today? Oh, that's a good question. So I know here in DC, the stay at home order lifts uh, on the 24th. I doubt that they're actually going to lift it. Uh, they might change it, but it, I, you won't be able to go to the gym on the 24th. I'm pretty sure. Um, speaking, probably, of gyms, I think they, speaking of gyms, my gym, Gold's Gym that I was using here because it's just up the street, they just announced in the entire city of St. Louis, they're gone. So all those Gold's Gyms are just gone. Wait, they're closed forever? They're closed, then they're not coming uh, back. Wow. That's tough. I mean, that's going to that that's so within the 2 weeks, you know, you'll start seeing the banners come down and the you know, the space come up for rent and, you know, who's wow. going to rent right now? A whole bunch of community space. Storefronts are going to be impacted by this. So even if you were open, even if you were allowed to sell things, people don't want to go to stores. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so the the gym that I go to, they asked me to keep my membership because they said, you know, we're a local business. We'd appreciate it if you kept the uh, membership up right now during these hard times. And when we can go back, we can credit your account. And, you know, I, I, it's it's not that expensive per month. So I figured, why not? Um, so it, it's, it's good to support the business because, you know, if one day they go under, that's the only gym I can walk to, right? And so wouldn't be a whole po a point of, saying, Hey, I want to pull that membership right now. Um, but I don't think in the next eight or nine days, it's going to lift. I think the national guideline had said May 1st. And so I know New Jersey announced today that the schools are going to be closed until the 15th of May. It's probably going to go a little bit further than that. I just think that the kids are, are done with school now, right? They might be doing their assignments, but for all intents and purposes, don't expect to be going back to school because once you in another month, who knows what the real landscape is going to be. And, you know, the, our, our other hotspots going to show up. You don't know, because if you go to one of the stores here in Northern Virginia on a weekend, it's packed. So, <laughs> right. What's to say that there isn't something going on there. I don't know. Right? I think I if, I, say for sure. if I were the parent of a kid in high school, I would be trying to figure out how am I going to get this kid into a program that they can keep their athletics up because you're going to, there's no way they're doing fall football and, uh, and basketball at the high school level. Like maybe they are in some places, but they're not going to put all these kids on a bus and have them travel from one, one city to the next to go share sweat with other people. Like all that stuff is done for the next fall. So now, if you could pick that up and, and, you know, make sure your kid's not too depressed and figure out how am I going to keep them athletically centered so that in a year when we come back, they're not out of shape and didn't, didn't advance their skills. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff. Cause it's like, it's hard to stay productive right now. Cause 
every every hour there's some kind of new announcement and you don't know like what to do right and so even in that face of it being hard to keep productive it's like you know did you like you feel pressure constantly that you need to like maybe use this time to learn something new but how do you do it with so many distractions like it, it it's really hard to balance like i think uh, most people alive throughout history haven't necessarily lived through a pandemic disaster right and so we have something in common with the people from 100 years ago and from the uh, black death Europeans from 700 years ago, right? And so that's just kind of the experience that we're going to have to log and, you know, make sure people are taking accurate accounts of it day by day. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to let you go, man. I'm so glad you gave me time in the middle of your day, but um, you were talking about news and how much is valuable to you. Where do you find news and information that matters or who is somebody that you think worth following that people will be like, oh, that's a good place to learn from? I'm a little bit biased because when I'm looking for medical information, I go to the medical journals. And so the medical journals aren't necessarily the ones to get the news out first, but usually the ones that they do get out, they have some degree of accuracy to them that doesn't exist in the news that has to come out uh, hour by hour. And so New England Journal, Lancet, but you also have to be skeptical of those sources too, because this thing is moving so much faster than how medicine normally moves. M medicine's usually pretty slow at moving on things. And so when you have these studies that are getting published, there is some degree of accuracy to them, but there's also some degree of skepticism that you need to have too, because when you look at it and think, is this something that they would have normally published in normal times? And if the answer is no, then you need to have an extra degree of scrutiny applied to when you read it. And so that's where I get my primary news because, you know, day by day, you know, the numbers are going to go up. They're not going to go down, at least for right now. And so you need to know more for, at least from my perspective on the science and what the conversation is in the scientific world. So that's where I get most of my news. All right, man. And if people wanted to find your YouTube videos or find you on Twitter, how would they do that? It's at Chubby Emu. And uh, it's all one word. E's not capitalized. And you can find it on uh, YouTube as well. Just type in Chubby Emu one word. All right. And I will throw your uh, coronavirus uh, Chubby Emu video in the show notes. Man, thanks for hopping on here. This was great. Perfect. Thanks so much for having me. Be safe out there, man.